Cambridge IGCSE Chemistry, Paper 6 Preparation, Titration Technique. Knowing the names of various bits of glassware often examined in Paper 6, so can you name these three pieces of glassware? Okay, so here we have a burette, a volumetric pipette, a measuring cylinder. Another topic or examination, compare the advantages, disadvantages of each instrument when measuring volumes. So compare a burette to a volumetric pipette. What are the advantages or disadvantages of a burette? Okay, so if I reveal my suggestion, a burette measures any volume of solution, whereas a pipette measures one volume of solution, often 25 centimetres cubed. What's the advantage of a volumetric pipette over a measuring cylinder? Or what is the disadvantages? A measuring cylinder, the is much quicker to use. However, a volumetric pipette is much more accurate. So here are three further items of titration equipment. Can you name them? Conical flask. This is a distilled water bottle or wash bottle. Now, please note, all glassware must be rinsed with distilled water before use. Often a question. This is a white tile. The purpose of a white tile would be? Well, you place it underneath the conical flask to improve the clarity of colour changes. So let's get into some titration technique. The first step is to carry out the washing routines. So for the burette and volumetric pipette, the first thing to do is to rinse with distilled water, as mentioned on the previous slide, that is to remove impurities. Then rinse with the test solution. We need to remove any distilled water that remains in or on the glassware. So rinse with distilled water, removing impurities, then getting rid of any excess distilled water by rinsing with the test solution. A conical flask also needs to be rinsed with distilled water, but there is no further rinsing with the test solution. The burette and volumetric pipette are measuring quantities of solution. The conical flask is receiving a measured volume. Therefore, it mustn't contain any of that solution itself. However, it does need rinsing with distilled water to get rid of impurities. So having prepared your solution in a volumetric flask, we now need to extract 25 centimeters cubed, the usual volume. You may need a different volume. Um, using a volumetric pipette. So here is our volumetric pipette with pipette filler. I have a traditional image there. You may have a more modern one to use in your laboratory. I hope so. The procedure before you use the pipette is to rinse the pipette with tap water, distilled water, and then a little of the solution that is to fill the pipette. So that's the same procedure as for rinsing the burette. Now, having inserted the pipette into your volumetric flask, you'll notice that there is a graduation mark at the volume printed on the pipette. Um, in this case, I'm assuming it is 25 centimetres cubed. So we're going to fill the pipette up to the graduation mark on the pipette. Obviously, bottom of the meniscus as previously. Having filled the pipette to the graduation mark, you then 
obviously remove from the standard flask and transferring a short distance to a conical flask, a clean conical flask. Make sure that the conical flask is close to your volumetric flask and you're not transferring that any distance because we don't want any drops or any loss of solution from the pipette. So my recommendation is that you remove the pipette filler and allow the pipette to drain Touch the surface of the solution with the pipette and allow the pipette to drain for 10 seconds after it appears to have been completed. You will then see that there is a small volume remaining in the pipette. That is meant to be there. That is part of the design. So the pipette delivers 25 centimeters cubed from the graduation mark to the tip of the pipette but the small amount of solution held in the pipette is taken into account in measuring that volume so your pipette when empty should have a small amount of solution in the tip so we have 25 centimeters cubed of a solution of known concentration in the conical flask. We now need to prepare our burette and the burette solution. So the process for preparing the burette is the same as for the volumetric pipette. That is, you rinse the burette with tap water, then with distilled water, then with a little of the solution. We fill the burette from a beaker with uh, the, shall we say, the solution of unknown concentration. And of course, we need to make sure that the tap of the burette is closed, which is in the position as indicated. We also note that we have a beaker underneath the burette. We do not place the conical flask under the burette at this point because there may be spillage in this part. You often, when you're inexperienced, overfill the funnel and then you have solution running down the burette. So we don't want that going into the conical flask of our test solution. So a beaker to catch any, any overflow. So here is a burette ready to be used with the solution. That's now been transferred to beneath the burette. There are three errors in the setup of this burette. I'd like you to pause the lesson and look carefully at the burette what are the three errors? Come back when you're ready to discuss further. Okay, so I can help the situation by a diagram of the burette in the correct setup. And you'll notice there are three distinct differences. Firstly, the filter funnel, or the, sorry, the burette funnel has been removed. The burette funnel often has the potential to drip into the burette during a measurement, which is obviously not desirable. So the burette funnel needs to be removed. You'll notice also a difference here and here. If you look very closely, um, we must fill below the tap. And finally, the position of the burette tip is within the shaped part of the conical flask. The conical flask is shaped as it is to allow the, the burette funnel into its mouth. So in this arrangement here, on the left-hand side, we can see there's the potential for spillage. There's no such potential on the right hand version. So it's the right hand version that is correct. 
So we then, having noted the initial volume, we allow, we add some indicator and generally we'll see that there's a color change and at the color change point we stop the, the um, titration and we take the final the final volume so the volume de delivered by the burette is the difference between the initial and the final and that is called the titer so you are expected to interpret pictures of burette readings and deduce the volume delivered so we have an initial reading and a final reading and then another set together an initial reading and a final reading write down the volume in this burette in this in this one and in this one so there are four readings there what are the volumes write them down okay so we're going to start at zero and we've delivered 0 0.6 centimeters cubed here again we've started at zero and we've delivered 18.3 so we're reading beyond 18, that's 18.3. We're not reading up, we're delivering and the meniscus is falling. So we've delivered 18.3. Here we've delivered 9.2. We've started at zero and the level has gone down in the burette to 9.2. And here, 21.0. So here's an important point. All volumes must be recorded to at least one decimal place. So here, for instance, you may be tempted in the paper six exam to write 21. You won't get the mark. It's 21.0. All volumes recorded to at least one decimal place. So recording burette readings. Paper six normally presents the results table in this format with the final volume above the initial volume and then the volume delivered being calculated as the difference between the final volume minus the initial volume comes to 17.6 centimeters cubed so if we start with 0 0.6 finish with 18.2 the volume delivered is 17.6 centimeters cubed however Titrations are repeated to increase reliability of data. Now, I haven't seen a question like this in the most recent papers, but it's definitely a fair examination question according to the specification, the syllabus. So we might repeat titration two, starting again, the initial volume 18.2, final 30.4, this time, the tighter the volume delivered was 12.2 well that wouldn't be in agreement so we would need to carry out a third titration starting at 30.4 we deliver to achieve a final result of 48.2 which means the volume delivered is 17.8 now 17.6 and 17.8 are in quite close agreement However, the value 12.2, we're going to ignore. It is anomalous. So to achieve the average, we average the titers, the volume delivered that agree. So 17.6 plus 17.8 divided by the number of items two. So we would say that our average volume delivered is 17.7 .7 centimeters cubed so we've improved our accuracy and our reliability by repeating discarding an anomalous result 
and then averaging those results that are in close agreement. There is some factual knowledge required of indicator chemistry. There are three indicators you are required to know about. Litmus paper is red in acid and blue in alkali. Thiamorphalin, used in titration, is colourless in acid and blue in alkali. Methyl orange is red in acid and yellow in alkali. Now, the volume at which the indicator changes colour in a titration indicates exactly reacting quantities. That's why that colour change point is so significant. And it's the basis of all titration calculations. Please see other lessons. The point at which the indicator changes colour is called the indicator end point. Methyl orange is a rare indicator in that rather than just seeing a colour change from red to, red to yellow, at the end point, a mixture of your red and yellow produces an orange colour, which if your eyesight is good enough or your colour perception is good enough, can be identified. So the exam answer is what is the, to the question, what is the colour of methyl orange at the end point? The answer in the mark schemes is orange, a mixture of red and yellow. However, in acid, methyl orange is red. In alkali, it is yellow. So some factual knowledge of indicator chemistry and colour changes is required for paper six. Obviously, at this point, you need to find some past paper six questions on titration and as well as the mark schemes, answer them, check your answers, etc. If you found this lesson helpful, please recommend it to a friend. Of course, there are other Paper 6 preparation lessons you could visit. Good luck on Friday.